Hello everyone and welcome to The Loft. My name is Wesley Garcia, Director of Loft Connections, and my pronouns are he, him. And my name is Julia Black, and I am the Director of Worship, and my pronouns are she, her. The Loft is a conversation-based community, and that means that we believe that conversation and open dialogue with one another is the best way to connect more deeply with our faith and the divine. We're also an inclusive and affirming community that welcomes all people from all walks of life. But we do a special invitation to the LGBTQ plus community. You are welcome here. You are supported here. You are included here. We gather together every Sunday morning at 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. But we are not just Sunday friends. We also get together multiple times throughout the week. So if you have any interest in joining us or if you have any questions, please reach out. We can be found at theloftla.org. Thanks for tuning in. Come be a part of the conversation. Something always brings me back to you. Never takes too long. No matter what I say or do, I still feel you here till the moment I'm gone. You hold me without touch, you keep me. so much than to drown in your love and not feel your Today's reading comes from Luke 5, 33 through 39. The people said to Jesus, John's disciples often fast and pray, and so do the disciples of the Pharisees, but yours go on eating and drinking. Jesus answered, 
Can you make the friends of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them. In those days they will fast. He told them this parable. No one tears a piece out of a new garment to patch an old one. Otherwise we'll have torn the new garment, and the patch from the new will not match the old. And no one pours new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise the new wine will burst the skins. The wine will run out, and the wineskins will be ruined. No, new wine must be poured into new wineskins, and no one, after drinking old wine, wants the new, for they say, the old is better. Please join me in this prayer for new wineskins. Loving God, help us to find the material for the new wineskins of our day. May the faith, spirit, gifts, and other elements of our wine that we have so long tended to find new shapes and forms that meet the needs of your people and your creation in this time. Grant us your wisdom to preserve the essence of all that you have blessed and given to us in your abundance. May we be generous, generative, passing on these new treasures to a new generation, but allowing them a new way to evolve in your name. Help us, O God, to shed the old wineskins of things that no longer serve us or your church. Break us out of brittleness that keep us resistant or complacent. May we instead be renewed and expanded by the joy of your presence, surprising us in new ways. May this blending be a blessing to all your people, your creation, and may the wine of our lives outpoured be your love as a gift to all. Amen. So Molly, I know you and I have been digging in during this holiday season to figure out, just like everyone else in the loft, what in the world are we going to do with the holidays? The pandemic is increasing in intensity and there's no signs of letting up and uh, we don't see anything in the new year uh, until the new year in terms of early vaccinations. And so holiday is super important time for those of us in faith traditions and not in faith traditions. And so we've been wrestling through how to do this. So one starting place that uh, we're considering is this notion of ritual, uh, its importance, what it does for us, and how it might be important or not important to kind of uh, lean into that during the season, even while we're all separated and pulled apart. So I was looking through the kind of neuroscience research and trying to really understand, I'm at this point in my life right now where I'm flirting with atheism. Uh, and part of that gift is, uh, I read a book that Wesley suggested called Finding God in the Waves. Um, and uh, he does, the author does a great job of kind of connecting every one of his spiritual practices to really understand the neuroscience behind it in such a way that he can both scientifically and faithfully reconcile like Christian experiences has been kind of cool. So in the midst of that, I was looking at with this ritual stuff for holidays and a set of researchers out of Harvard did this cool study where they went about understanding how ritual works. And so uh, they did something, it was kind of funny. They took a bar of chocolate and they said, all right, they gave it to the study participants and they found that if they took the bar of chocolate and gave the participant a clear ritual of how to experience it. If they took the bar while it was still wrapped, broke it in half, and then unwrapped one half and ate it, and then unwrapped the other half and ate it. If they did that with one person, and then the other person in the study, they just told them to eat the chocolate bar. The person who went through that small ritual of steps actually thought that they, the chocolate tasted better when they rated it, and they were willing to pay substantially more for it than the person who just ate the thing like normal. So there's something about in our, in our, in our psychology and the way that we approach things that if we add ritual to them, it creates value that doesn't exist. It just by the very act of our tangible ritual, it creates meaning and symbolism. So it made me think like, as we kind of approach these holidays, perhaps the creation or demonstration of ritual by itself is in and of itself valuable enough to do just because maybe the thing that we do creates the value that exists in the world? And you were, you were thinking about from a church history perspective that there might be a little more going on there. Yeah, so my brain works in a very different way from yours. So while you were thinking about neuroscience as an <clears throat> explanation for the importance of ritual, I was finding kinship in the mystic Julian of Norwich who was alive in England in like the 14th century and is treasured today as a great mystic in our Christian tradition. I was finding such kinship with her because so much of her situation felt resonant with this moment that we're in when things that we have counted on as the way we do things seem to be falling apart and inaccessible in the present moment. So Julian lived in the midst of plague um, as uh, some vast percentage of uh, her home in England uh, as well as all of Europe was lost to the plague, something between 30 and 60% of the population, which is just 
uh, unimaginable to think of that devastation. It was the midst of the Hundred Years' War. It was at a time when the uh, in, within the Western Christian church, the papacy was split. There were two popes. And so all of these institutions that people counted on were falling apart and were inaccessible. And it's in the midst of that moment that Julian had a profound experience of God um, and of a God who uh, offers gifts of assurance, of promise, of belovedness, and of, well, she called it oneing, which is not a way we use that word in English anymore, but uh, for me, it's more vivid than unity because it talks about this like uh, being made one with the divine, which is really powerful. So in, even in the absence of all of the institutions and structures that had been the container that she you know, came to faith in, it, even in the absence of all of that, that she was able to access this powerful connection to God and to humanity is for me great reassurance in this time that even if we lose all of these things, we don't lose something essential and true and beautiful and good about our relationship to one another and to God. So I guess I'm finding like hope and comfort in that. That's awesome. And I wrestle with that because I'm like, uh, part of what I'm wrestling with is does the container matter or is it the thing behind a, a, an old friend back in Texas became popular for this saying, everybody wants the thing without the thing that makes the thing the thing. And so is there this notion that the container and whatever the container supposedly holds, like I, I'm wrestling with, are those two things distinct? And so as we look at our scripture for today, it's the story of Jesus talking about uh, wine and like as a, as a reflection of Jesus's own story, this idea of new wine not being able to be put into old wine skins because otherwise it would cause it to burst. So Jesus is saying, whenever this new story, this new, this, this I guess, uh, update to the story comes in, uh, how do you put that into a new container that can actually hold it? It's why I think a lot of us, as we've gone on our faith journeys, have really wrestled with, um, for those of us who've come out of fundamentalist or evangelical traditions in particular, um, can, we, can we even have church as a container? And so what does that mean? So in the scripture, Jesus is talking to a, a, a group of his contemporaries, and he's, this particular scripture of this new wine and new wineskins is placed in the midst of several stories, which is all about Jesus taking these containers, the Sabbath, who you're allowed to socialize with, like all these buckets of things, and basically saying, just get rid of those containers. We need new containers. Uh, this, the, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath, that whole thing. And so Jesus just goes through and kind of reconstructs those things. So in my brain, as I, as I look at this and I think about ritual and I think about what, what matters, I think we just need to reshape the containers. I feel like if you rebuild church, if you make church the rituals, the forms, uh, even the, 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 the way in which we read scripture, like our hermeneutic, if you shift all those things and change them, you actually fundamentally change the thing itself that's actually there. I don't know that there's anything behind the thing, except that the way that we live our lives and our practices make the thing so. Does that, does that resonate? This, right? So this, that is, this is my fear, is that we get so concerned about the containers, about the wineskins, that we stop asking whether we're actually participating in the making of wine, whether the, the thing that's behind the thing is still present with us. Um, I certainly have been frustrated in our institutional church that we get so obsessed about figuring out all of those sort of containers and structures that we uh, fill all our agenda with those worries. And in, as we move into this holiday season, if we fixate on all of the the details of, you know, side dishes at the dinner table or, you know, decorations or whatever the thing is, then do we miss out on, uh, is it possible that we'll forget about the thing that is of essence there? I have this hope that um, even as uh, so many things have failed and like local and in bigger ways, uh, in institutions and organizations that there's this persistent showing up of the Holy Spirit, even when it's like in spite of failed systems and structures. I mean, I think of the, the way God continues to work to gather people in community sort of around the margins, 
in a powerful way that's life transforming, that's like in spite of what the official container was doing, but through innovation that persists in the good stuff. I, I totally feel great authority in saying this because I recently started an experiment in winemaking using fruit from my backyard. So I, I bottled it in the actual containers this week. So I totally have actual authority in talking about wine containers. Uh, well, on that note, uh, I hear what you're saying, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm slightly converting to your perspective. Here, here's what I'm thinking. Uh, as we take this from like the 30,000 foot version, we're being a little abstract in terms of theory and thought, but to pull it back down to the tangible, and particularly as we think about how to celebrate the holidays, like obviously Christian tradition, all traditions, the idea of family and connectedness is like a thing that matters. It is a thing that, that at some level family is a container, but it's also a transcendent reality of connection um, and belonging. And so as I, as, when I was in high school, my mom decided that I was getting ready to go off to college and she wanted to make sure that we were finding ways to be knit together. So she put in this practice, um, relatively inexpensive one, where we'd like drive out to LA together and spend a couple of days in a cheap hotel, going to the uh, cheapest amusement park on the planet, Knott's Berry Farm. And so, so it, was, it was super low budget. Uh, mom was still finishing grad school at the time. It was like, it was like a really tough time. But there's something about that that ritual that got created that when I think back on that, I mean, like Nutsberry Farm is like the knockoff Disneyland, uh, you know, the cheap hotel wasn't the Marriott, the Hilton or the, or, or the Four Seasons. It was like, but there was something in that moment where something got created that transcended kind of whatever, whatever the, the trappings were of that time. That as I think back on the experiences of my life, like what I find most meaningful whenever I'm like talking to someone about what's most important in life, it's those few days every year that like fill my soul with something that I can't describe or can't transcend. And so as we think about this holiday season, me and my family have been like, I've been like doggedly demanding that we figure out something to do some practice that can fill that space because whatever was created transcendently in that moment has been so critical to who I am and my sense of belonging and, and peace. And I know you've been doing some rethinking yourself. Yeah, you, uh, you got me thinking about this too. And I realized that I have been tremendously grateful for the ways that external structures, we talk about sacrament as an outward and visible sign of an inward and spiritual grace. And those outward visible signs have been things that have carried my faith when I wasn't sure what I believed, if I believed, and how to say what I believed. Um, it's a gift to have these ancient prayers and liturgies uh, to have beautiful art and music, to give form to faith, even when I'm not sure what I would individually, uh, you know, give myself to, that like carries me along in the sense of being connected to a community that matters and to a, a thing beyond myself that is a gift. And then well, let's dig into that together as a community. Josh Lopez Ray is here, he, him, his. Thanks again for being with us today. If you would like to stay connected with the events happening in the community or perhaps one of our groups that is currently meeting online throughout the week, please visit theloftla.org. And please support this work. If you uh, found it helpful, please share it with others who might find it to be a blessing. Another way that you can support if you're able to is by giving online and you can also do so by checking out the giving tab on the website so as we leave this space today may you dare to be brave may you know that you belong and may you remember that you are loved peace